Yeah. Yeah. Now I'm a, now I'm an independent consultant in culture and technology, which means I don't which means I'm unemployed. <laughs> <laughs> consultant means. Um, yeah. So and I'm, I'm actually living in D.C. So I took the bus up here. It was a lot of fun, and it's great to see all you guys today. Uh, maybe like a quick show of hands. How many of you folks like art museums? Okay, now how many of you maybe don't go as often as you would like because of some uh, access related issues, like you find museums not to be terribly accessible? Maybe you could just like shout out what are some of these things that make museums feel not accessible Text. to you? Text. Text labels and things like that, right? Anything else? Things oh, behind glass. Uh, things behind glass, right? Like too high up or, um, okay. Anything? Always. Yeah, 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 we do that. We, I was in charge of the installations of lots of um, touch screens for information displays. And there would be like, you know, uh, we would like follow the letter of the letter of the rules sometimes in the Met and you would have like all of the touch screens at like adult standing person chest height. And then there would be one, right? There would be one that would be down low or that would only whatever information was there on that screen, that's what you got. Um, anyways, but we do have, you know, at the Met, we do have a, a, a pretty, uh, pretty amazing accessibility staff, um, and I manage the media lab there, and we we're always looking for ways that we could collaborate for some reasons that I'll get into in a bit. Um, and uh, a couple of years ago, we um, hooked up with Parsons New School for Design and Technology um, to do uh, uh, an access uh, museum access design. Um, Collab workshop is what Parsons would call it. Uh, every year they would do a different, um, what they call a collaboration workshop, where they would put students in touch with um, a uh, some industry, some industry, uh, and uh, get them thinking about what, like, sort of outside of the box thinking for using technology to address issues inside that industry. And so for this semester, the industry was museums, and we we're challenging the students to think of ways that. Um, technology could um, enhance, improve, change um, the experience of museums for people with different types of disabilities. So I'm going to talk a bit about that um, today. Uh, I have two partners who are going to join me in this talk. Um, Rebecca McGinnis, she's a senior museum educator for access and community programs at the Met. Um, she's in Russia at a conference right now. Um, Catherine Morwacki is assistant professor of media design and the School of Media Technology in Parsons School of Design, and she's a maker here today, so you just have me. You're one third of the present, one third of the amount of excitement you would normally get. Um, so this is Parsons, they run the Design and Technology program. Um, any, any Parsons graduates out here today? None? Okay, well, they're, they're good, they're not the best, your school is, is better. <laughs> Whichever one that may be. Uh, but they, they, it's, it's, a, um, it's not unlike like IT, NYU's ITP program, and they have a graduate design technology uh, 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 degree where they encourage students to really think outside the box and think about ways that advanced technologies and design can be applied to um, Different different industries. Um, they focus a lot on on the design aspect of it. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how they approach these issues, sort of using their uh, Parsons methodology, which um, I think is, is pretty exciting. Um, the Met um, has a great access and community development program that's in charge of making sure that the museum is continually evolving in the way they think about access related issues in the museum. As you, most of you may know, the museum is very old as a building. It was built over time. Um, as rules and regulations and our understanding of access have changed, the museum physical component has had to sort of struggle to keep up, as well as um, thinking more carefully about exhibition design, experience design, programming, and making all of these things accessible. They do a really cool drawing for the blind program that I think is run by um, Emily Gusso now. Um, they do uh, um, an AS ASL uh, art tours, which are actually some of our most 
popular art tours because ASL is such a great language for talking about a visual medium that lots of people, even non-ASL speakers, go to see. Um, Emmanuel von Schack is, is, is one, of my, my, one of my favorite ASL art tour guides. And lots of people go to check him out. He's the number one um, tour guide. Um, and then there's the Met Media Lab. The Met Media Lab was uh, started about three years ago. Um, we are tasked with finding ways to explore new technology and how it could impact the museum experience. Um, but uh, we uh, sort of the, 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 the um, process that we developed for advancing that kind of exploration was to reach out very aggressively to New York's creative and technology community and invite them into the museum to pursue their own projects and we give them lots of feedback and a space and do um, shows, shows of their work. And so every semester we take on about a dozen interns from different creative technology and museum studies programs and walk them through these um, uh, design thinking sort of process and help them to realize their own ideas which we then show at the Media Lab Expo at the end of every semester. So, so our, our thinking in the Media Lab is that museums are great repositories of all this content and history and knowledge and information, all these amazing objects. Uh, we're not great technologists all the time, um, but New York is full of amazing, creative, young, energetic, enthusiastic um, uh, students and artists and, practice and, and hackers and coders who can be, and if we can show them that the museum is a really interesting space to work, a really challenging, uh, enriching, fulfilling problem domain, chew on for a bit, we can make a lot of really neat stuff in the middle. And so that's how this project came about, this conversation with Parsons, how, about how can we um, get your students thinking about accessibility within the context of the museum, really let them go blue sky with the kinds of things that they're allowed to try, um, and celebrate what happens. Um, so the Media Lab model for developing collaborations is that students provide the energy and the enthusiasm and frankly the low paid labor. Um, <laughs> to get that stuff. But we, the way, you know, like there, there's lots of crappy unpaid internships are the Media Lab unpaid internships are the only, is the only unpaid internship that Parsons DT actually recommends for its students because we focus on giving the students real value for the energy that they're putting in and we support them in, in their ideas. So it's one more, almost like another type of class that, um, that, they're, that they're taking, but inside the museum environment and in conversation with the collection, our visitors and uh, museum experts. Um, so the academia provides a structure. We would meet in, in Parsons um, in their classrooms and we'd bring people into their classrooms to talk and then the students would come into the museum to try out their ideas. Um, also, we reach out aggressively to the, the professional community. In this case, it was the access and technology industry professionals that we knew through our contacts and brought them into the classrooms, meeting with the students and mentoring with them every single week throughout the semester with these students. Um, then, this, then the museum itself provides the feedback and the physical space for the students to try out their ideas and iterate and continually improve their designs. Um, when we went into this, really the, the Met's goal wasn't to develop some production ready product that they could put on the floor and you know six million visitors a year could use it. We didn't need to build something that, um, that uh, was ready for prime time. All we needed to do was uh, explore different ideas that could push us in new directions and, um, and set the stage for future experimentation or get people thinking about new directions to go. Um, Parsons was really interested in exposing students to the practicalities of universal design. Um, well, I, I'm, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here, right, uh, when I talk about universal design. And frankly, a lot of this information was new to me when I started this, uh, working on this project. But um, I was surprised that in the School of Design and Technology, none of the students in the room, if I said, who's here has heard of universal design, none of them would raise their hands. None of them had really heard of universal design, which was um, just a surprise to me. Um, but one of the things that um, we learned through the class was that uh, by teaching these students how to design for people that are not them, it improves their overall design skills, right? Just universal design 
the end of the day, improves design for everybody. And that was um, a lesson that was really made real to all of the students through this program. Um, and so if anyone wants to shout out, if you know any of these people, I want to give a little cheer. That's great. Um, we, the, the, the core um, uh, of what made this project so great is we had a bunch of really amazing advisors who basically were just museum enthusiasts who had, with, with varying uh, disabilities that they could speak about. Um, Emmanuel Von Schack, Alba and Anastasia Samosa, Linda Manny Jacobson, Constance Van Rollahem, Don Katz, Dana Simon, and yay! <laughs> and Annie and Least uh, were some of our participants in this. And they would come, you know, uh, every week, every other week, meet with the students, evaluate their projects, and give them feedback, um, and, uh, um, and really help the students develop sort of an empathy for uh, different experiences unlike their own. Um, we had folks from the technology industry, folks like uh, Richard Ellenson, Alan Brightman, uh, Steve Landau, Mark Sarabian, Adam Kress, and uh, Sean O'Shea. Um, we also would come every week and help students understand you know, the fundamentals of access and design technology um, uh, and, and sort of some of the distinctions between designing for access and universal design like this. Um, Parsons, uh, Catherine Morwacki was our was sort of running the class. You know, she's a teacher for the class. Um, and Apon Palanowicz was uh, teaching assistant, documenting everything, uh, uh, video uh, videotaping stuff. So that at the end of the day, we have lots of great um, videos and material that we could share beyond the class. Um, all, lots of great museum staff. Um, I'm showing sure all these names just to give a sense of um, there was a lot of people involved in this program. I think there was more support staff than there were students, uh, which is maybe one of the reasons that the, that the results were so well, well packaged and displayed. <coughs> Rebecca McGinnis, myself, Zoe Mercer, Golden, Daniel Linzer, Marie Clopeau, and um, Karen Clemens. Karen Clemens runs our evalu educational evaluation program, so we also had somebody surveying the students and advisors throughout the program um, to make sure that you know, uh, the goals that we are setting for ourselves, that we had some sort of accountability for that as, as we went through the program. Um, I'm not going to read off all the names of the students, um, but they are up on a link that I'm going to be sharing with you at the end of the, at the, end of the presentation. Um, these are mostly MFA, Master of Fine Arts uh, in uh, Design and Technology students, but we had a few uh, bachelor's students as well, and some, and some students in um, interdisciplinary programs. Um, so there's a, there's a variety of different perspectives. And some of these students come from like electrical engineering backgrounds, and some of these students come from like fine arts and, and graphic design backgrounds. So there's a real broad spectrum of experience that these students are bringing into the program, and some are traditional, like graduate student age, and some were some were older too. So we had a nice spectrum of students, and they're all coming into this class for different reasons. Some of them had a lot of personal experience with accessibility, and others just um, wanted a, a different type of challenge. They saw designing for access as an opportunity to do something very much outside of their realm of experience and, and sort of flex their muscles in a different way. Um, in terms of the process and how the class went down. We spent the first, uh, I think, two or three weeks of the class, they, they met every Wednesday, um, essentially learning the basics of universal design and asset and, and, uh, and designing for access. Explaining to the students um, uh, what universal design is and hearing from the professionals on, you know, why, why people say the iPhone is better for access than something else and the limitations of designing for a standard interface versus designing um, and the challenges of designing hardware for access and building something that works versus something that is robust. Um, and so getting a real practical experience from these, from these uh, professionals is pretty amazing. Um, and then another big part of the, the Parsons process for design is developing empathy with your users, right? Developing a real understanding of their lived experience with technology and with the environment that you're trying to solve for. So we would hear from every week from our advisors who would talk about what it was like visiting a museum as a person who is blind. A lot of the students would ask, you know, um, speaking naively, like, well, why does a blind person go to an art museum? Um, and really, you know, there were some of the 
some of the participant advisors would say, well, for, for the same reason that most people do, to hang out with their family and go to the cafeteria. Um, <laughs> <laughs> why not break you just to be in an environment that's social and you're surrounded by these beautiful things and, and, and can catch the atmosphere? To say nothing of things like touch tours and, and, uh, um, and drawing programs and things like that, um, more specialized programs. Um, and so the process, right? Um, basically the way we do this, and this is stuff that I've modeled in the media lab since then, is we took a, they took a roughly a three week cycle of, of, of designing, prototyping, and testing with their users over and over again. So they would go through an ideation process. Uh, well here we've got four, four pictures here if I go um, um, across from the top. It was an ideation process where they um, you know, brainstorm write up ideas on a whiteboard, as this student is doing here in this picture, um, and connect ideas, and, tr and just um, sketch a lot of stuff, right? Throw anything at the board, see what sticks. Um, and then they start prototyping. And all these students were exposed to paper prototyping for the first time, where you draw, you draw an interface on sheets of paper, and as a person sort of pretends to click through these sheets of paper, you replace them with other sheets. And so they use this to practice different types of interfaces. Not to say that everything they were doing were on screens, but just to give a sense of they were developing skills to help them take an idea from something that's a sketch to something that a tester can hold in their hands and, and give real feedback on. And then they would do testing with our advisors to see what, um, to, to see how well their ideas really worked. Right? In this picture here, these two students were working on a piece called Raised Painting. They wanted to make a, a painting touchable. Right? They said, well, what would it mean if I take this Picasso painting of Gertrude Stein, and what would it mean to touch that? Do I want the person to touch a physical uh, image? Of, do, do, do I want a person to physically touch Gertrude Stein? Do I want them to touch the painting? in terms of this particular painting by Picasso, what's important about this painting. We uh, had a really great visit with, uh, with a, a curator of European paintings who took us through the galleries and we would look at um, classical oil paintings, right? If you guys think about oil paintings in the museum, it's very polished and sumptuous and everything has got that glaze on it. Um, you feel like you could reach out and touch those materials and everything's about sort of the luxuriousness of the fabrics and, and the play of light um, and this tactile sensation. And so for a painting like that, we decided, well, you would want to sort of model actually the physical sensation of touching that fabric that's being painted. But then if we looked at an impressionist painting where everything's more sort of daubs of colors and there's a sense of, of motion and, and timeliness, um, we realized that, that you might want to, there might be another way to make that tactile, right? Well, if you look at, say, a Mondrian painting, which is just lines and, and grids, touching that would be a very different type of experience. And, and there's not just this one-to-one -one translation between here's the painting and here's the tactile version of that. So, um, so they went through, iterated through a lot of different paintings to try to figure out, and a lot of different materials to figure out what would be good relationships. And every step along the way, they were testing this with visitors with dementia and then blind and low vision visitors to see how they would respond to these different things. And then every, um, in every third week, they would have what we call desk crit or critique session, where they would stand up here kind of like me and they would say, well, this is the research we did and this is our proposal and these were the results we got. And all the students would raise their hand and you know, um, tear down their ideas, criticize, and we'd usually just say nice things and sort of point and nudge them in directions. Um, and some of our advisors are, would stand and say, well, that what you described there sounds useless to me. Um, do something else. <laughs> it was nice, I mean, we had advisors who were just not afraid to say, like, no, this is, they, this is my chance to speak to my experience. I'm gonna be heard here. And so they were not shy about sharing their experiences and their responses to these proposed solutions. To so these designers who are really, for the first time, learning to have empathy with, with a, an experience that wasn't their own. I think that, um, I'll, I, in my experience, when I look at these the young designers, particularly in technology um, schools and design schools, they tend to um, make the things that they would think would be really cool, right? They design, in a sense, they kind of design for themselves. And this is their first experience trying to design something that isn't just cool because they think it's cool, but is actually useful for a person in a way that doesn't apply to them personally. 
and I, that was a real challenge. Um, so as far as the, the projects goes, basically we had four teams with uh, four different projects. Um, one group, uh, Yeha and Camilla uh, Kilbalska and Megan Duralak, they um, worked a lot with blind and low vision visitors, ex um, trying to really understand how you write code for screen readers. They went through the Mets website, and I don't know if any of you folks have um, used a screen reader with the Mets website. If you raise your hand, I can apologize to you in person. <laughs> <laughs> it's not awesome. It's not awesome. There's like link, 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 picture, link, link, picture, link. Um, and so they redesigned the Mets website sort of from the ground up of what would be uh, a website that was designed specifically for screen readers. Um, and so we could compare those two things side by side and realize, well, there's definitely a lot of improvement to be made on the Mets website, which they're doing now, by the way. So there's a whole screen a website refresh coming where um, I, I think that you guys will be pleasantly uh, surprised with how much better of the accessibility of the website has gotten. Um, because through doing, making these, making these um, books here, these students basically they made two best practices books. One was about writing software for uh, writing web pages that are accessible for, for screen readers uh, and best practices. And the other was on, on writing visual descriptions of art objects. And um, these kinds of things are informing some of the work that we're doing now, which is um, a great example of how the work we did is feeding into things that you're going to start to be able to see on the Mets website. Um, Another project was about accessible wayfinding in a museum. A lot of people were complaining that, and this is not just, everybody complains about the Met is hard to get around, right? <laughs> yes. Excuse, right? And there's, there's areas that are dark, right? There are areas that are crowded. There are areas where the floor is like, it, it's, very, it's acoustically very live. Um, and there's areas that um, guide dogs don't terribly like because of the, the acoustics. Um, someone actually was demonstrating, I think, a shofar in a, a in, in one of these galleries, and there's a guide dog there, and the dog completely lost it. It was very sad. Um, so what, the, what this group did is they went around the whole museum, and for every single gallery, and there's a lot, they um, identified, the, the, they coded the room according to like four or five different characteristics. The acoustics of the room, um, how the, the lighting, the floor type, um, and how crowded it was, sort of on a subjective scale. And they coded all of this into a database. And then they prototyped interfaces where a user could um, sort of specify their preferences. Like, I want to see these four objects. I want to go to these four galleries. But I really don't like crowds. Can't handle crowds. And I, I can all see where I don't want any dimly lit rooms. And it would design an um, optimal path for, for respecting those preferences. So what we see here on this screen is two maps of the museum with two different paths to see the same things but respecting different preferences in terms of the path on the left um, goes the shortest path and the path on the right avoids crowds and, and uh, yeah, dark rooms or then you can see it, it, the, the, the path you've been given goes around these spaces. Um, of course that introduced some new problems. I was like, well it's one thing to show a line on a map but how do you help someone you know, actually execute on that line, and that's 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 a project for another day. Um, um, this project is called Eye on Art. What you see over here um, um, on, the, on the left picture is Alba Samosa, um, who has cerebral palsy, as wearing what it looks like um, a pair of glasses with a little computer over the lens. There is a group called the Graffiti Research Labs that a handful of years ago was working with a graffiti artist who had lost his mobility but for his, his eyes. And they designed this thing called the Eye Writer. And the Eye Writer allowed this graffiti artist, um, Tent, is it Tent? Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, to, do video, to, to do graffiti uh, with his eye. And he could control the, the movement of a laser pointer on a, on a large video wall with his, with his eye. Um, so they took, and all these designs were sh are shared online, and they're open source, and anyone can do them. So these, um, these students took apart, I think you take apart like a PlayStation video camera, and use this, um, and, and they built their own eye tracker. So the, the idea being that with someone, someone could wear the eye tracker and look at a painting, and um, other people could see where on the painting that they were looking, and you could develop, um, uh, a system to track where the person was looking and use that to fuel a conversation about points of interest in a painting. 
Uh, and they, you know, it was interesting because this is a situation where, okay, we've got this thing as an eye writer. Now, what can we do with it that's for access? It seems like a good idea. And, and, but it was definitely a, a, a situation where the technology was sort of leading, was the start of the story. And then, like, well, then what do we do? Which is not, you know, generally in design, we say don't lead with the technology, but sometimes it's fun to lead with the technology, mm -hmm. and it can lead you to, in some interesting directions. Um, and the, the last project was called Ray's Painting, and this is what I was talking about earlier where they had they settled on a Gertrude Stein painting because figuratively it had particular areas that they could highlight that had a shape that was easy to communicate in a tactile way. So they designed this piece where they took sort of like the, the main lines of Gertrude, the, of Picasso's portrait of Gertrude Stein and made what kind of looks like a, like a puzzle, puzzle piece. Um, and underneath each of the, um, uh, on this platform had the puzzle, and then next to it were the, the like five pieces that could be fit onto to, to complete the painting of Gertrude Stein. And when you would lift up a piece, it would, uh, there was an optical sensor underneath that would say, "Oh, this is Gertrude Stein's hand. This hand was this the, this hand is was um, painted in a less of a cubist style and more of a flowing style. It fits roughly in the lower third of the painting in the center. And then as you would fit it into the painting, it would tell you some more facts about it." And you would, um, yeah. So it, it was a fun. Like I still have it, but it doesn't work anymore um, because these are prototypes, right? Uh, so that was the that was the fourth project. Uh, so as you, see, you can see, they kind of went around the gamut, right? From really practical, like we just made a book here, you can read it, to <laughs> like talking puzzles, right? And all of that, and this kind of thing happens because at the beginning of the class, we weren't really specifying the types of work. We were really letting these students sort of bring their own energy and their own enthusiasms into this in conversation on an equal sort of playing field with the advisors who are the users and the technology industry professionals and um, creating a safe place for them to try all of these things out. Um, and then of course the, we, one of the most important parts of what we do in the Media Lab is we celebrate this work. Uh, we did, as was in 20. 2012, 2012 uh, Met Parsons Access Expo at the end of the semester. At the Met, we held this in one of our large lecture halls where we had all the projects set up on tables and the students could show their work and um, we would give, present about it to the public. Um, and this, honestly, um, this didn't exactly go completely swimmingly because while we spent a semester with these students working with people with different um, ways of taking in information, um, they hadn't practiced presenting for access. Mm -hmm. And it was halfway through the presentations where, if, if you've ever seen Parsons, uh, the design students presentations, usually, or it's, it looks like Kickstarter videos, right? So usually it's like a really slick looking video with like some sort of like emo rock soundtrack in the background <laughs> and text flashing up. And they would say, okay, well, we're gonna play a video for you. And I have to, you know, the, the, a good chunk of the people in the room, they're just hearing like an emo rock soundtrack. And they're like, oh God. We never, you know, like, just didn't, you, you got into your, a lot of designing for access for these students was about breaking out of their habits. And so it, and we just, you know, lesson learned, right? Don't, don't do that, you gotta plan for these things. And even right now, I'm sure that I'm, I'm, I have a lot of my own bad habits in terms of presenting for access. Um, and so I, forgive me for that as well. Um, so, yeah. Um, so in terms of the things that have happened since, like I said, this was just four projects. None of them went into the galleries. The books you can get online, and they're, and they're pretty useful. But what was great about it is how much the, the, the kinds of um, things that have happened since then. Obviously, we have great, uh, we've cemented some great relationships with the access community, um, our visitors. We've developed new programming with some of the people that we work with through, this, through these um, classes. Um, the Mets continuing to collaborate with Parsons. A lot of the model for how we do classes, we started to incorporate into our own design work in the museum. Um, we have some of the themes that we addressed in this class, we've continued to follow up on. In the media lab, we've done multiple um, uh, projects involving multi-sensory uh, art experiences, from smellable art to chocolate art, art that you can put in your mouth. Um, different ways of experience. We started to expand the way we think about how you can experience art um, and technologically mediated experiences. Um, we've done additional work with audio descriptions in the, in, in the museum. Um, we've taken the, the initial database of 
um, and prototypes of accessible wayfinding in the museum, and we we built we built it. Um, we had another student build the algorithms, another student develop the interface. So we now have a program that lets you say, well, if you like these three paintings, you'll probably like these other four paintings. And this is how you can see all of them. Here's a path to see all of them in the museum and turn by turn directions that avoid stairs and uh, crowds. Um, we have that, all that code you can download. It's all been shared on GitHub so you can download it yourself. Um, access continues to be a great theme at the Media Lab for a lot of the same reasons, that it's a great way to teach our students to design for design outside of their own uh, experience. And also, frankly, like a lot of the um, the tech that, that people with um, disabilities use is kind of awesome. And there's some, it's just, there's just a lot of fun, and cool stuff you can do in that space. And a lot of the students really um, are attracted to that. Um, and additionally, Parsons is really um, enthusiastic about doing more access workshops, potentially in other domains. So if any of you folks are interested in connecting with a really great group of students, um, then you can contact Catherine. She's giving me her permission to share her email at the end of this as well. So um, a lot of good stuff has come out of this in the years since. Um, some of the things that our students have learned um, in a real practical way is that you know access isn't an afterthought. It's not very helpful to sort of tack access onto to, uh, a digital experience after the fact, um, that when they design for access, they improve design for everyone because they just are thinking more carefully about who their user really is. Um, the design process itself needs to be accessible. Um, and we, you know, just these types of collaborations between diverse communities lead us in really uh, unexpected and exciting directions that, we were, um, that we've been pursuing ever since. So, in case then the rest of you are interested in getting involved, I don't run the Media Lab anymore at the Met, but you can totally call Marco um, Castro Cosio and tell him that I said that he should work with you guys. Um, in addition, Parsons is very interested in doing more of these types of collaborative workshops, and they're always looking for really great um, use cases and 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 testers um, for their for the students and mentors for their students to work with. Um, they're really like. The mentorship experience with these types of students is just is just fabulous. I'm not totally in love with it. Uh, and you can contact Catherine Moore Wacky if you want to learn um, more about that stuff. So um, thanks very much. This is a picture of the of our of our Met Parsons Access Technology Collab students there. Um, I can be reached at donandine at gmail.com. Um, and Catherine Moore Wacky can be reached at Morawack. Morwack K at newschool.edu. I'll give you guys these emails in person if you like. Um, this tiny URL, the top tinyurl.com slash A11Y2015BHF. Um, I don't know. Um, is, uh, um, you go there and all my notes from this and all the links and, and resources, you can get to all of that um, on that page. Um, that's tinyurl.com slash A11Y. 2015 BHF. Um, awesome. Thanks so much, guys. Are there any questions? I'll probably... Okay, we have time for a few questions. I, I have a, probably a very silly question. This was very cool. Oh, thank really you. Really interesting. Um, and I know you can't speak for the next, so I'm oh, I will. asking you to be. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, it, what, I, what I find at the Met and at most museums, mm -hmm. you know, somebody mentioned text, I, I, the curators love to put small black print on slate blue. Uh huh, yeah. <laughs> Something that even the fully um, uh, vision, full vision folks right. can read yeah. in very small text. Because yeah. of course they don't want to take away from the artwork, and it's totally right. understandable. So what is the Met doing about, I mean, this is really one-on-one -on -one kind of mm -hmm. stuff for Yeah, well, what, what the Met is doing is sort of they are, Met's really enthusiastic about strategy and consolidation right now. They've got a new head of design who is basically looking at the Met's entire, entirety of the Met's design thing. Like in the past, things have been designed kind of separately from each other, one exhibition design, not really looking at another one. Now they've got a design department that's saying, no, this is the font, these are our color schemes, this is how things are going to be done. 
Um, meaning that as access uh, issues get addressed, they're getting addressed over the whole museum. It's not to say that like they liked a lot of red and white is very popular right now, and I'm, I don't find that that easy to read, but this is like the thing, that this is the colors, right? But at least they've got one person making that decision instead of making a bunch of different people making this different decisions all the time. So these things can be better. Any other questions? Awesome, thanks guys, thanks so much.